This movie will be wonderful, this Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, Consciousness, Contact, and the Human Future. That's what we're going to call it, that Lance is working on. Because what we really want to do, my objective, is to, in a way that does, that the masses can relate to by doing a part of the film on the science of consciousness and the experiments that have been done, connect that to Interstellar and to the CE5 protocols and then show some of this. And also have Man on the Street, those of you who are part of teams who or have done CE5 and had contact, you know, can also be interviewed uh, if you want to be seen by a lot of people. Our goal is to have that be, be something that raises consciousness of an understanding so we reach that 1%. So 1% of the people begin to really understand consciousness, meditation, and contact in the human future and begins to manifest it, see it, make it real. And at that point, our civilization can go boop, move over, go forward, hyper jump to a level one. It'll be a coherent field propagation that that one percent. And so that's that what with that 75 million people, I hope you guys will help us. We're going to announce probably in the next month or so um, a crowdfunding campaign to, to make the movie. Um, right now, you know, we haven't done that. We just haven't had time. But if you anyone here who can help fund that, uh, we're going to to make this a, a feature film that sh will be renowned and with the production values we want be fairly expensive but we also want to get it out properly you know when they did what the bleep do they know they spent x amount they spent x amount on the film and 10 times that on what's called the marketing and, and public relations and getting the word out so we want this to be much bigger than that uh, but we're going to need a lot of help to do it because we don't have a big corporation funding this and um, i'm retired <laughs> <laughs> from medicine and so I can't do it all by myself so I hope some of you here will help us thank you for that yeah so I would like to open this up to uh, to questions it's a small group um, and so the next 30 minutes I'm, I'm opening the floor I don't want you to give a speech just ask you know because no one can hear you you're not mic'd and there's no PA system just articulate a question and so I can answer it and we'll share it with everyone yes sir about any uh, materials being analyzed and uh, turning out to be quasi-crystalline? Almost all the important uh, teleportation, zero-point energy, and communication systems are all crystalline. Quasi-crystalline. Huh? Quasi-crystalline. Quasi-crystalline. Well, they can flux from a crystalline to a non-crystalline basis, yes, but they're, they can flux. And even in the at Ber Lawrence Berkeley Labs, they were doing things with uh, energy systems that were uh, barium titanate crystals the, with energy s wires going in and out. But what people don't know is that those would then become uh, enlivened and begin to recruit energy from the zero point field. So you need to have materials that can flux and, and flow. And that's very important. However, remember that the ability to, to have materials that, that are going to work well is dependent on the level of consciousness of the people to understand it. And when you get to the very advanced civilizations, those materials are all at the level where they can interface with consciousness and thought and very advanced systems. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I actually interviewed you about 15 years ago. I came to your home in Washington. Uh, oh. And uh, for a potential film project. And um, I'm, I'm delighted to see how, how you've sort of moved along since then and where you've taken the work. And I guess one question for you is um, how do you feel about the limits of your own? Coming up against the limits of your own knowledge, um, that, that you've had a lot of experiences through the years that have brought you to where you are now. Right. But you don't know everything. Right. And how does that feel? Um, 
sort of talk about uh, what, what you talked a lot about what you feel like you know. Talk about a little about what you don't know. Well, there is, it's, it's the articulation of what we all know. So let's get back to this. There, there, there's your, your individual capacity to understand, which is varying. But the truth is, in consciousness, all of us have Ritambara Pragya. We have the book of all knowledge in us. Now, understanding and unfolding it, it's a lot. I, don't ha I am not someone who's very good with, for example, mechanical systems or um, the physics I understand, but theoretically I couldn't build you anything. In fact, my wife won't let me touch the computer. But So there's a great deal. Most of what there is to know, I would say I don't know. However, the things you do, you can know and discover, you should share. The other part of it is that people know more than they think they know. If they go into a meditative state and begin to have this experience. Uh, the part of this that's, that's the big unknown to me is, and because there's no way to predict it, is how humans are going to, how this is all going to play out. How, in other words, how do we get from where we are to this path uh, without blowing the whole system? And there are probably a billion different ways that can happen. And it's so complex. It's a fractal, uh, it's a very super complex system. And every single person that's doing anything in this space, and even the ones who aren't, will affect that outcome. However, you don't, you know, I, I think the focus on what we don't know, that most of what there is to know in the cosmos, we don't know yet, including the operating systems of the more highly developed civilizations. We just know sort of the phenomenology and the expressions, but the operating systems, not known. In fact, the, the, the people I know in the intelligence community and military are still studying, for example, the cloaking mechanism of a craft that was downed in, uh, near Fort Sill, Oklahoma, that's being studied to figure out how that operates still, and as at least of 2012. So I think that there, there's m the, the details of this are, and the operating systems and the details of the technologies, huge amount of discovery. So there's this massive sort of exploration and discovery yet to be un unfurled within uh, knowledge of, of uh, humanity. However, the, f the, the, the deep basic knowledge of consciousness and science and all the, the physics of understanding trans-dimensional systems, there's more knowledge about that than we're being al allowed to, to even embrace because it's been kept secret. And the most brilliant people I know in the scientific community uh, do not work at a university. They're certainly not at Harvard or Stanford. They're in a skiff. They're in a secure communication and information facility or a DUM, a deep underground military base working, and they're incredibly talented. But their work isn't benefiting humanity. So this is where the whole question of disclosure, and those, some of those guys, I sit with them and go, wow, it's unbelievable, because I am not an engineer. Um, so I think that we have to set up the, the foundation in a, a mass movement in, in society so that those people, let's call them, are liberated from the cages of these dumps, deep underground military bases. But in those, even in those, those guys will tell me they don't really understand how, like some of these things you've seen here, they don't know how that's happening. You know, so there's seeing it and understanding the fundamentals of it and then knowing the specifics of how you're doing it technologically and technically. That's thousands of years, I would suspect, of, of knowledge and development and exploration. Certainly, I don't know about. So I'd say most of what there is to know in the universe, I don't know. But what I do know, I do know. <laughs> I don't only talk about things I know. Yes? One of the things I've heard you say is that extraterrestrials have taken a certain liking to Maharshi Mahesh Yogi's interpretation of Vedic literature? No, that's not true. Okay, so um, 
So just studying the Vedic A, I've never said that. B, it's not true. C, it would never be true. So, <laughs> uh, well, <I> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so people hear what they want to hear. The, look, let me, let me just put it this way. This aspect of consciousness, which is the non-local field, look at it as the hub of life. And each of us are a spoke connected to that hub. And if there are seven and a half billion people on this planet, there are seven and a half billion paths into that hub and experience. I had a friend who was a medical doctor on our CE5 team in LA. She'd play the harp and get into a state where she would get into pure consciousness and have these amazing experiences um, because of the tonality and her oneness with the tones coming from the harp. So what I'm saying is there are there's an, almost an infinite number of ways, so I have no attachment to whatever. All I'm saying is that I, there's a certain body of knowledge that exists, whether it be in the ancient Vedic teachings or the ancient shamans. And they really, when you study them deeply, they're all expressing the same thing, but in different ways to different cultures at different times. And, and that's sort of my understanding of it. Yes? In your opinion, what level of consciousness was ancient Atlantis on? <laughs> he asked about ancient Atlantis. You know, I mean, that's a good question. Ancient Atlantis, there's, of course, the understanding that out here in the Pacific, there was uh, Mu and Lemuria and the, that whole, we don't really know what level of consciousness. It wasn't at the point where the difference between the time we're moving into, this it's called a yuga uh, or sat yuga this era that we're moving into versus the era that, of the past in the last 450,000 years or so, is that there were civilizations that came and went that were advanced. This time, it's going to be the entire globe will become peaceful, interplanetary, and enlightened together. So it's not just one part or one culture that comes and goes, rises and falls. The, the term that's been used by, I like, is that it'll be a day not followed by the night of ignorance. It's like the rise. However, you know, if you go back millions of years, this is my own understanding, pre-homo sapien, because the humans have only been on this planet a certain discrete amount of time, there have been uh, advanced civilizations here that have come and gone. No doubt there was one on Mars that left and or that biosphere eventually vanished for reasons that are speculative, but it could have been a terrible war. My point is, is that there is no question that civilizations on this planet have existed way pre-recorded history. Now, whether or not, you know, some call it mythologically Atlantis or Mu or what have you, I have no doubt that's the case because there's a man who works on, well, he actually is under contract with IT&T, works for the CIA, but through corporate contracts who the intelligence community and military bring him devices that they find deep in the ocean or in the earth that are technological, that are hundreds of thousands to millions of years old for him to figure out what could this have been used for. And uh, I mean, he's told me a great deal of detail about that. And so we know that there have been advanced civilizations on this planet. Uh, my understanding is that Earth, which is about four and a half billion years old, has had life for about 700 million to a billion. But for a long time, there had been, been civilizations and even higher intelligent beings for which we have no record, or it's only a mythological record. So that's, that's my understanding. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so can you give us a little bit detail about uh, meditation and the contact that you guys do? Like a short brief. <laughs> a short brief. <laughs> like okay. Are you, it's a location that these uh, alien beings just pass in. We don't use alien. Okay. That's someone, an alien is foreign. Here, here's why I think words are important. Words convey consciousness, and we've all been programmed. Alien is synonymous with foreign. So ET or extraterrestrial isn't. And so what I'm trying to do, I know it sounds ridiculous, but words that are loaded, I try to avoid. And they carry with it otherness. Whereas I want to move us into the awareness of, there, there's really, the, the vastness of the universe, there's one people. 
and we are they. Okay, so there's nothing alien about that. It's a, that's, there's no us versus them anymore, if you understand. But the meditation, uh, it can be any meditation technique. There are a few. I like the uh, watching the breath Zen uh, technique uh, that's very p powerful. There is a, a technique that involves uh, mantra, uh, mantra meditations that we teach that can allow people very quickly, it's an advanced technique to settle into quiet consciousness. Uh, we had someone with us in Shasta who was teaching people the Tai Chi and some other techniques. I don't, I don't have an attachment to the vehicle. I, I, I think what we need to be focused on is the goal, is where we're headed, and that's into that quiet state of mind. But personally, what I have found to be most powerful is Techniques that allow you to become centered and calm, whatever that is, it can be a mantra, it can be your breath, it can be something else, where you then in that quiet meditative state can go into the unbounded. It, you can let go of the, of the of your individuality and the relative world. And there are many, many, many approaches. I mean, the, 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 some, you know, the whirling surfi, Sufis had a technique to do whirling. I think that many people have discovered different techniques and one thing I will say is that the reason I'm very, one of the problems with humans is that they mistake the lantern for the light. <laughs> All right, the lantern here being the outer form or the person or the guru or the teacher or even the avatar for the light that's within. And then we become attached to the lantern. Next thing you know, we're having World War III over the lantern. Right? right? right. You know, my God is better than you, God, that whole thing. So I think what we need, we need to get to an understanding that this sort of state of pure, quiet consciousness can be attained through many different approaches. You need to discover which ones are most appropriate for you. And if it works for you, then do it. Um, it is important to have a certain discipline about it. I think it's important to put time aside for whatever meditation approach you use two or three times a day on a regular basis in a disciplined way. And if you have opportunities to go on a retreat where you can do it intensively, uh, you know, for a week or two, that's great to do. I mean, instead of going to Las Vegas to the casinos, do something, a deep meditation retreat where you can really collapse the time frames because it's an exponential growth when you can take time away from the world just for yourself to sit quietly do nothing meditate and explore consciousness together so that's what i recommend yes hey uh my name is dan arcturus we run a, a c5 in uh, nevada city grass valley area um with my friend yvonne and so i have a question about i've talked to you before about fear-based belief systems mm. So, uh, given that not everybody here is going to be speaking with anybody in political power or any of that nature, <laughs> such as the Clintons or anybody like that, what is your method um, of approaching these fear-based belief systems? Can you give us a reflection so that we can, in a sense, deal with that in our life? Well, when you deal with people who are attached to this sort of uh, a Manichaean worldview of an us versus them in black and white, I think that you have to first listen and see where they're coming from. Yeah. And if it's someone who's a political figure, military figure, uh, intellectual, one of the points I make is take the technologies we have, extrapolate it forward thousands or millions of years, then visualize those technologies weaponized, turn into weapon systems. So that if these civilizations really were hostile to us per se, it would have been all over in 1945. All right, point, set, match, done. But you have to take them through a technological uh, exposition and sort of uh, you know, disclose to them there are technologies that are way beyond nuclear, way beyond even what classified projects have but if those were wielded by civilizations that were at a level zero, like we are, they would have blown themselves up long before they got here. And if they were here, it would take a nanosecond to terminate 
this civilization. It'd be very finished. So that's just a rational discussion. Now, here's where the nuance comes in. It doesn't mean, what I just said doesn't mean that these civilizations are thrilled with what's happening on this planet. So I make a distinction between the misadventures of the military and the intelligence community doing things that are very dangerous and harmful to us and to these other civilizations from their being intrinsically hostile to humans or Earth. If they were intrinsically hostile to humans and Earth and wanted to conquer it or shut it down, it could happen very instantly. But there are, these civilizations are not pleased, let me put it this way, with, with the current status quo, because let's step back, let's just step back a little bit and look through the eyes of a civilization at level one, two, three, and above. You have a civilization on Earth that has had the capacity to establish a peaceful world with zero point and free energy, save the environment, eliminate poverty, have justice on this planet for almost 100 years. We haven't done it. And instead, we've gone down this side path, it's a terminal extinction path of weaponizing every technology first, massive amounts of, of secrecy, the world being damaged through old 19th century fossil fuel and, and, and mid 20th century atomic nuclear power. Meanwhile, the earth is dying. I mean, we're killing the biosphere, species are. So if you were an ET coming from space and you were to just dispassionately observe the wars, the destruction, the ecosystem damage, uh, the, we the weapons putting in space, the targeting of their craft, you could be excused for being a bit dismayed and not pleased. Now that doesn't mean that they're hostile to us at, per se as a people or as a world. It means that they're probably hostile to our hostility. In other words, they're not happy with, and for that reason, there are things that have happened that have been misinterpreted and spun. Which is just a response. It's just a, it's so, so where, they're, where it's been spun into some sort of a threat. Now, if you, if you wear rose-colored glasses, the whole world looks pink. Um, so if you're a military person where anything out there that you don't control and that's in and around the earth is a threat and you're going to approach it as a threat and try to develop technologies to kill it, then that's coming from that level of consciousness. So from that level of consciousness, yes, you know, but I think from, the, from what the objective dispassionate view is, I think these civilizations are waiting for us to reach level one. Yeah. They're understanding we're in this transition period. They want to assist, but they can't do it overtly. I mean, if they landed on this planet and said, now you're at a level one, we're taking over. Well, that would not be effective because there's no evolutionary learned uh, inheritable consciousness that goes with it. And moreover, I mean, it's like us going to Afghanistan trying to impose Jeffersonian democracy on warlords. This is a, it doesn't happen that way. So there are, they, these civilizations certainly understand where we are, but they also, and this is the beautiful part, I'm convinced they also understand the potential and the beauty of humanity and the earth, making it through this transition and the kind of beautiful planet we can have post phase transition into level one, two, three, and four. So I think they have, a, they're taking a very long view. Uh, in the meanwhile, they, there are things they have to do to be careful. So I explain to people, you know, rather than giving in to this uh, false dialectic and sort of us versus them, uh, Manichaean view, black and white, and you know, we, that's all coming from the consciousness of division. We need to come from the consciousness of the unitive state, look at the long view and also with the heart of compassion, understand the human condition compassionately, but also understand how these civilizations might be viewing us both in ways that are 
positive in potential, but also concern, deep concern about what's happening. Many people have had contact with these ETs going back decades. There's a deep sort of spiritual and eco-spiritual message that comes through those contact experiences for a reason. Uh, because you know, some of the military guys who were in these ICBM facilities were in craft were, came outside and they were taken offline at Minot, North Dakota, some of the disclosure uh, people had told me, a captain, uh, Salas told me, his feeling was that they weren't really a threat. Because obviously if they're a threat, they're going to shut the whole system down. They were trying to say, we're very concerned about mutual assured destruction and these weapons that could destroy the whole biosphere. Please don't destroy this beautiful planet. And, and that's what he felt from that experience. Now, the people who have wanted to spin it into Alien Invasion Week at the nuclear silos. Well, this is just rubbish. I mean, you know, obviously they could have dematerialized every ICBM we have and moved it out. They know that that's not the way to do it. But at the same time, things have happened from these ETs where they've tried to let us know you need to move off this course. So it's a gentle nudge. It's about power, not force. And power is different from force. There was a book by this, yeah, true power. yeah, genuine power. So you have to understand the consciousness and understanding of that that kind of civilization. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I noticed there's no chemtrails in your pictures, and that's a relief. Do you think that the, um, our friends up there are transmuting them, and also maybe dismantling uh, potential? Uh, effects from CERN, or uh, I've heard they dismantle nuclear weapons. Well, yeah, the he, she's asking about various uh, interventions that have been done to keep the worst from happening. There have been. So, for example, I, d I think that there are a number of times that we could have gone to DEFCON 1, which is D Defense Condition 1, where you're full nuclear launch, um, where that, that has been kind of stopped and things have happened quite amazingly. Uh, so they clearly see that we're in trouble and they're trying to see that we don't have the worst happen. And I also, my understanding is that there's a great deal of, of activity with them monitoring and even documenting the biosphere damage, uh, doing uh, sampling of the biogenome let's call it the collective uh, genome of the planet, plants, animals, organisms. Uh, much of the activity that's been seen by ET craft are taking samples of water, samples of uh, species and what have you because they're extrapolating the rate of damage way ahead of anything our supercomputers can. And I think that's being watched with great concern, but also there may be an element of it where they're documenting things so they can be re put back in a worst case scenario. I don't want to get too far into this discussion. Uh, I call it plan B. <laughs> in other words, as Tom Bearden said to me once, don't get me wrong, the fools may blow it yet. So uh, I love him from Louisiana. Uh, but yeah, the fools may blow it yet, in which case there could be a uh, brief um, uh, overt the intervention to stabilize the biosphere and, and what have you. Um, th that's something that is a very long discussion. I'm very familiar with it. So you, you develop different contingencies. That's one contingency. Yeah. Um, yes? What have you ever learned about the applications of consciousness and new technology as you apply it to healthcare? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's so beautiful because, you know, as a doctor, a lot of people say, oh, why aren't you focusing on that? I, and I go, well, why not focus on healing systems that are transdimensional? I said, well, those aren't going to be allowed to be used any more than a zero-point energy device is going to run your car to replace the uh, internal combustion engine uh, until we as a people come together and decide we're going to make this so. What I understand about them from just even classified systems that exist, let me start with human classified systems, is that they have abilities to take disease states and transdimensionally reverse them, up to and including regenerating a severed spinal column or a limb that is off, the phantom limb from, the, from that 
sort of, if you will, subtle energy template of the astral, have it come back. And I was in an underground facility near the Mexican border some years ago where they were doing that kind of work. Um, so, I mean, I don't, you know, the stuff I've been exposed to, most of it, I don't, can't, I can't, there's no foundation for me to talk about it publicly because it has no credibility unless I can get the scientist in that skiff, that base that talk about it. But what I've seen, if you're asking me personally, I know that we have the ability to do a great many things that would revolutionize medicine, uh, revolutionize uh, healing, that are scientific uh, technologies that are in this trans-dimensional interface between material and the gap, the interface between those subtle energies, let's call it, it's, people call it subtle energy medicine, but I mean on a very scientific basis, technologically. And people say, wouldn't that be okay to come out with? I said, well, it would, except then the scientists would say, well, if you're doing it for this, why can't you do it for that? And the that would terminate ExxonMobil and the petrodollar. It's a part and parcel of a problem. So again, we need to get our act together. Once we do, the civilization that we'll have here is beautiful beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, this side over here, yes, sir. Can't hear you. Sorry. Given that uh, many free energy devices have been invented already, um, and maybe they're maybe you've already tried this, maybe there's a good reason not to, but have you considered going out to shafts that have been there with even engineers and asking, will you please show us how it's done? <laughs> that would be like giving a supercomputer to a caveman. So, I think what we have to understand is that from human engineering and understanding these technologies have come, we have to put a strategy together. I've recommended um, an incubator fund to do an open source uh, development of these sort of zero point technologies that are stationary. Let's leave the anti-gravities aside for a little while because those can be missile delivery systems and come forward with an energy generation system that can replace everything that's running the, 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 the planet right now, including fan jets could be replaced with these kind of things without it being anti-grav. But that, that project needs to be, have serious scientific and um, uh, strategic support. The reason that it's never happened is that the technology teams have approached it like a new software package or a new iPhone or a new Samsung Galaxy. In other words, they put it, they shroud it in secrecy. They cry, try to go the intellectual property route. At that point, it is intercepted two ways. It's either bought out and black shelved, or if you don't agree to getting it bought out and black shelved, you're just flat out killed. And those technologies are taken. Now, there's a man who was being groomed and courted by uh, a CIA agent named Sajaki, who I knew many years ago, to um, be part of that effort uh, to work with the intelligence community. And in the process, they let him copy a lot of the documents and patents related to some of these devices dating back to the early part of the 20th century. I have that CD. Now, that CD, which has all that on it, would have to have a team of people begin to put it into from two-dimensional into three-dimensional engineering systems. And that's going to cost something. There's a certain quantifiable amount to have the security and the, the tactical and the engineering and the right equipment to do it. That's not going to happen with a few hundred thousand dollars. The, you know, the, the, the analyzer and electronic systems themselves, each bench station is probably 500,000 just to do the right frequency work. If you're going to do it carefully and not kill yourself or kill someone else or shut down the radio frequencies and you, there's no FM or AM radio reception in the city. I mean, there are a lot of weird effects of this I won't go into. What I'm saying is that to do it properly, you need to have people who know what they're doing. And what I've been asking is that, is, is that the, the, either the public or, and or the, uh, some high net worth people come together and put an incubator fund to get to, together to, to make that happen. But with the knowledge that it's gonna be open source, like GitHub. 
It all has to be open sourced. It has to be live streamed. Each breakthrough in the technological development needs to be put into the public domain. And you need an education and PR system in place. So at each point of development, there are at least you know, somewhere in the in neighborhood of 10 million to a billion people who know about it. Because if they don't know about it, it becomes the tree that falls in the forest that no one knows about. So there is a strategy for doing this. We've developed it very carefully. I have a strategic plan and a summary. If anybody wants to fund that, give me a call. If anyone has an existing technology that is legit, let me know. Um, it has to be independently reproducible. It has to be able to run itself. It has to be able to be reproduced only from plans by some engineering teams I have in place on standby, ready to go. And then you have to agree that we will dump that knowledge into the internet and into every media massively, instantly, as soon as it's confirmed. It will not be kept secret. It will not be go the patent route. And if it, so that's. I might also add that if it's a legitimate existing technology, there are people who I'm associated with who they don't want to get involved until something exists, but they don't want to put the funds in until something does exist. But when something does exist, then they'll do it. So somebody need to be bought out, let's say. You had someone who was an engineering team that had a system like this. They've spent their life's work. That, I have people now who could make them happy so that they could be involved and get financially compensated. But my goal is to get it out to the world open source with no restrictions. Because as soon as you go that route, you've given enough to, there, those are speed bumps you hit. And by time, that time is your enemy. Once you have a system that is operational, if you go that route, it, it will either be seized or the team will be killed. You know, it's like the people who got all Stan Meyer's equipment. Um, that's what happened to them. They were all assassinated and shut down. Yeah, because I was there trying to get that, and they went to people who had more money. Those people then got threatened, and the chief funder called me up hysterically and scared. And I wrote out a three-page strategic plan I just outlined in the last five minutes that they needed to do, but they wouldn't do it. They wanted to hold on. It's like holding on to my precious ring, my, my precious, my precious, and my golden ring. Well, it takes you down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. I mean, you, you cannot hold on. The technology has to be put out, and it has to be put out in a way that is effective and is reached by millions of people, and you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. You've squeezed it hard, bang, it's out. The reason for that is the system is set up to intercept, shut down those systems. Uh, inventors, technologies, people, any system that is actually a legitimate, so they call it over unity system, where it's putting out more energy and you have to supply, self-running, it could be mechanical, solid state, those are going to get intercepted. For heaven's sakes, there was a very advanced battery that uh, I know Tesla wanted uh, that you could have run, a, instead of 900 pounds of lithium ion, it had been a 100 pound battery that go 500 miles that could charge in 15 minutes. And uh, a, a big oil conglomerate bought that technology out, black shelved it. So that's why your Tesla will go a couple hundred miles, takes 12 hours to charge, and hundreds of pounds of these lithium ion batteries. It's, it's not about what is technically possible. It's what strategically, and this is what I say to, to technology people, that you have to know the lay of the land. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's the fact that there are interest groups that have enormous things at stake, financially and otherwise, who do not want this out. They don't want the knowledge out. They certainly don't want the technology out. So if we're going to make this change happen, you have to do it eyes wide open, understanding what you're facing. And it's taken me 28 years to, to kind of wrap my mind around that. Uh, and sort of say, this is a strategy that'll work because I've been involved with people in the new energy fields since 1991, and every other strategy has failed, which is why you're still running a car with fuel in it. I think that's why we have to learn from history and not re reproduce it. And we have to have a different consciousness and strategy around 
uh, this sort of technological development. Uh, and again, I recommend uh, what I call a phase one technology. The phase one technology would be stationary energy generation systems that run your home, your car, stationary and fix in a car, but not anti-gravity trans-dimensional <laughs> systems. Uh, those systems are, uh, need to be phase two, three, four. Yeah. So I, it's getting a little past time. I'll take one more question. Yes, sir. Just for curiosity, this lady uh, mentioned. Uh, the I'm strings. Allison. Yeah. Hey. The those streams in the clouds that she was asked. Mm -hmm. Geo 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 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I w I'd like to hear what your opinion on those is. He's asking about chemtrails. My short answer is on the scale of one to two. I mean, one to ten of my concerns of what I'm dealing with. It's minus two. Uh, it, 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 most things are contrails you're seeing. The ones that are chemtrails, we know why they're being put up there. It's the left hand who can't control the right hand putting reflective aluminum and other particles up to reflect sunlight because we're losing our polar ice caps. And it's, the short answer is, it's a stupid band-aid on a dam that's breaking. All right? Okay. And, but I'm trying to deal with the whole dam breaking. Uh, that's what we all need to be concerned with. So I would say, uh, that's why I say on, a, on an order of you know, one to 10, it's a minus two in terms of what my concern would be. Thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it.